heaven so far. Let us follow the path that our master have trod. With the balm of his counsel, or strength to renew, let us do with our might what our hands try to do. Yes, yes. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hope and trust. Let us watch and pray and labor till the master comes. To the work, to the work, let the hungry be fed. To the fountain of life, let the weary be led. In the cross and his counsel or strength to renew, let us do with our might what our hands find to do toiling on toiling on toiling on toiling on let us hope and trust let us watch and pray and labor till the master comes to the work to the work in the strength of the lord and a robe and a crown shall our labor reward when the home of the faithful lord dwelling shall be and we shout with the ram, some salvation is free. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, let us all. Till the master comes to the work, to the work, there is labor for all, for the kingdom of darkness and error shall fall, and the lame of the father exalted shall be. In the loud swelling chorus, salvation is free. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hope and trust. Let us watch and pray and labor till the master comes. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Quarry. A fitting song. Amen. Relevant. Let us hope and trust. Let us watch and pray and labor till the master come. Toiling on, don't give up, amen. Don't give up, don't give in because the master promises us that he is coming back, amen. I'm gonna ask Brother Martyr at this time to pray God's blessing on our night study and our teacher at this time. Praise the Lord, praise God, everyone. Praise God. Praise God. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, Father in heaven, Father, we give you thanks, we give you praise, we give you honor. Father, you are good, and there's none Amen. like unto you, Lord. Amen. And thank you, Father, that you have made the way for us, dear Father, to come to you, dear Lord, in every situation that Ooh. we're in, dear Lord, whether in goodness, maybe in, maybe in bad, in whatever condition we find ourselves, dear Lord, that we can reach out to you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity, Father. I want to thank you. And I pray, God, that you continue, Lord, to guide us, give us strength, and give us courage, dear Father. Jesus. Dear Father, especially, dear Father, in time that we are facing, dear Father, that we may keep our focus on you, dear Father, that we may keep on trusting you, dear Father, because knowing that, oh God, that you, everything is into your hand, dear Father. You are you in control of everything that is happening, dear God. Oh God, I want to thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. And I pray at this moment, Father, for Pastor Corey, Lord, who are leading this service today, Lord. I pray a blessing upon him. I pray his strength. And I pray, Lord, that you continue, Father, to encourage him. Continue, Lord, to comfort him, dear Father. Lord, we want to thank you, Father. Though, dear Father, he's mourning at this time, dear Father. But, dear God, that he is stood here today, Lord, Father, to do your work, dear Father. Lord, I pray that you continue to be with him, dear Father. Father, the one that was moderating in the service today, dear Father, our teacher, Lord, I pray, Almighty God, that you will touch him, dear Father. Touch pray, him, dear Lord. Father, God. And I pray, Lord, that whatever that he shall speak, dear Father, it will bring honor and glory to your name, Father. Lord, thank you, dear Father. Thank you for all the brethren, dear Father, who have made it possible, dear Father to be here to support this cause, dear Lord. I pray God a blessing upon them. I pray their strength. I pray God for the, the family, dear Father, even the everyone, dear Father, the, of the neighbors, everyone that they, they encounter, dear Father, that they may be able to, to speak, dear Father, whatever they learn today, dear Father, they may put it into action, dear Father. Father, thank you for this opportunity again. Thank you for all the brethren, dear Father, who was Make it possible, dear Father, for to continue this service, dear God. Amen. Father, thank you and bless us and guide us, dear Father, as we continue to praise your name, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Amen. God. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. From whom all blessings flow. Thank you, Brother Martha, again. And let me say again a big welcome to one and all. Time is really, really essential in Bible study. And sometimes you think you have enough time and you just move. And so I'm not going to delay any longer to present our teacher tonight, um, the second week on the topic, the business of church. And tonight's subtopic is structures, standards, and expansion. And so we no further I'm just going to ask you at this time to welcome, as I present to you, our teacher, the president of the Conference of the Church of God, Southern Keeping International, Pastor Howard Green out of Canada, Toronto. Receive him in Jesus' name. Pastor Quarry, thank you so much. I actually addressed that tonight. Um, I hope it's appreciated. Um, <laughs> it's a special, <laughs> I decided to make it a special night. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for the opportunity to connect. Human connection is such an undervalued principle. Um, we take it for granted that, you know, we should have Bible studies and we should have, um, you know, regular Sabbath services and so on. You know, the Bible says in Acts chapter two, that they continued in the apostles doctrine and in fellowship. So fellowship is an essential part. It has always been an essential part of uh, the church. It is the human connection. Um, and so I wanted to say, I am very pleased whenever I have the opportunity to share with you, whether I'm listening or participating, um, I always feel very, uh, 
you know, proud, for lack of a better word. I also want to say that I feel honored. And the question was, well, why would you feel honored? Because, you know, it's not necessary for Pastor Corey to call me to teach. I don't think I'm saying a lot of things that Pastor Corey couldn't teach you. I think most of the things I've said, he probably knows already, and he probably could do, probably could do a better job. Who knows, right? But I think there's something beautiful in him, which allows him that humility to be able to bring others to the platform, although it's a, it's a task that he could obviously do himself. And I think there's a great lesson to be learned in that. Of course, I do not want to take up the entire time. I know it's being recorded and people perhaps will have the opportunity to watch it afterwards. So I want to get right into the meat of it. So greetings, Pastor Corey, Lisa, um, all, uh, um, all the brethren, all the ministers, the deacons, pastors, missionaries, workers. I want to thank you for coming on tonight. Well, I chose, if you were here last week, of course, the overarching topic is the business of church. And last week, I dealt a lot with uh, the fundamentals, fundamentals of church operation. And this week, as you heard Pastor Quarry spoke about, uh, we're going to talk about structure standards and expansion. I'll drill down into those a little bit um, for us. But I wanted to say that, obviously, the question that comes to mind is, Sister Martyr gave me the option of choosing from a, a list of uh, pre-created topics, which I thought was pretty cool. And then she gave me the opportunity as well to say, hey, you know, you have this list, you can teach in one of these, or you can actually, you know, teach in one of the lessons that you have. And I'm passionate. I chose this option because I'm passionate about it. Can I be real with you for a second? I believe that the number one challenge to the Church of God Seventh Day, Sabbath keeping, whatever we want to call it, Seventh Day Baptist, the number one challenge is not our spirituality, but rather our operation. And it's, 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 I truly believe it. I, I don't believe God has, there's any problem with God why our churches are not growing, you know? And this is a, this is a real challenge that, that faces us. Now it is already known um, for those who have even the basic knowledge of church um, development that the Church of God's seventh day and its tributaries are, came out of the same root as the church of the, as the Adventist movement. And if you have ever, if you, well, I don't think there's a person on this planet who doesn't know it at Adventist Church. Um, I actually had the opportunity. Can I tell you this one story? I actually had this opportunity. I was in St. John's, the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, took a trip out to the U.S. Virgin Islands and I went, um, I was staying in um, St. Thomas, which is a bigger island. But one day my wife and I decided we're going to take a day trip and we're going to go over to St. John's. So we took the, the boat and we went over to St. John's and we went walking a steep hill. We had walked off into some bush and I'm not kidding you. I went, so we're in this bush walking. If my, the only if my wife is on, she can testify to this. And in this bush, almost remote from the town, it's not a very big island. We saw the church of God, the, Venice logo and this beautiful massive building in this bush I was like I was saying to my wife this <coughs> excuse me um you don't have to put your mask on you, you're not going to catch anything I have um but I was I was flabbergasted by the idea that in this bush on this little island in this all this bush this beautiful edifice and I think that's where I got really inspired that it is possible and it's not God because the reality is, and I'm, and I'm hoping I don't offend anybody because I know this is an open uh, group. So <coughs> if you are, excuse me, if you are, if you are part of another church, let's say the advanced, 
Of course, this is maybe to your advantage, but I got inspired by that, that we came out of the same root in terms of church. And yet, for some reason, the advantage has been able to grow at a rate that we cannot be compared. So let me put it in context. The Adventist Church right now has over 22 million members. If you total the Church of God's Seventh Day, all of the organizations, including Church of God's Sabbath keeping, Seventh Day, Seventh Day Baptist, all those organizations, we're, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we're not even close to 500,000 people. So the question becomes is, what's the difference? And I got inspired by that. I got inspired by seeing this little church in, this, in these woods. Um, and the passion that these people have for building the work of God. So fundamentally from that time, I have always felt that something is wrong in the way that we do church. And I, again, I don't believe from a spiritual standpoint, it is the issue. I've always uh, contend that it is an operational problem and we don't do well with the business side of church. And so I'm saying all of that to say this, it inspired me to choose this topic. So last week, um, we put some emphasis and some body in this and we leaned a little bit into speaking about um, fundamentals of church operation. And they're worth, you can go back and read the tape, but I think for the purposes of just continuity, I'd like to just reconnect with what we talked about last week. And there were three key things that I kind of hovered over and drilled down into. Now, the first one was process that, that we saw from the Acts of the Apostles, that we, we saw process, that God is a God of process. And the church of God has never really mastered that very well. And it's not a, we cannot take it as a, as a negative connotation. It's just a reality. We just haven't mastered process. And what, what tells us that this is accurate is the number of church of God's seven days that exist in different facets across the globe. Right? So if you go anywhere you go in the world, you will see different church of God's Sabbath keeping, um, even, even, even in, parts of, of South America, which I visit very frequently. Uh, when I go to, to Mexico, there are churches down there all the way stretching down to Paraguay. And they're just, a lot of them are part of a cluster, but a lot of them are just their own entities. And um, that has never really worked well for us. So I am very passionate, amen, hallelujah. I am very passionate, and I think this is going to take me to my grave, about getting this thing done right. And I believe that God has called me to make a difference in this area. I spoke about it last week, that one of the things that God did for me early as a Christian was that when I came to live in Canada, um, I was studying in school to become an electrical engineer um, at the college. And God moved me from, from becoming an electrical engineer and I became a banker. And as soon as I joined the bank after a year, I moved into management. And I've been in management for 20, almost 23 years. And I, I believe with all my heart that it wasn't really about me, that God wanted me to see structure. He wanted me to see standards. He wanted me to see what it was to expand an organization um, and to have the framework that will be essential um, to build upon. One of the books that I'll be referencing tonight, and I didn't give this to you last week. Um, this one I'll add in the chat. So if you were not here last week, You'd have to go back in the chat and see the books that I had recommended. Um, I'm also adding to that list um, this book. I haven't read it fully yet. <clears throat> it was actually recommended, excuse me, it was actually recommended to me by uh, Pastor Rose, Wade Rose. And um, it's called uh, Visionary. 
uh, and it's written by Andy Stanley. Um, I want to give you so one of the quotes that I saw in here. Um, it's it's it, it, the book comprises of different things that he called building blocks, and in in block number five, Andy says in chapter uh, um, page fifty eight. What God originates, he orchestrates. I thought that was a pretty neat line. What God originates, he orchestrates. In other words, <clears throat> simply put, excuse me, whatever God, um, whatever God creates, God is going to create, is going to build a process for it for continuity. Whatever God creates, God is building a process for it for continuity. And I thought that was a brilliant line. Another book that I didn't have in my repertoire, and I'm giving you tools. You don't have to buy all of them. Um, I'm just giving you tools. Um, so Rick Warren, uh, The Purpose Driven Church, one of the most popular books, actually. It is actually said that this book is joined the ranks of the top 100 books that have influenced humanity um, in the last um, a uh, few uh, uh, hundred years. It's a powerful book. It was a bestseller, um, a New York Times bestseller. And it was written by uh, Rick Warren. Um, I think a lot of people on this platform probably knows this book. I actually highly recommend it. It's an easy read. It's not very difficult. Um, but one of the, uh, the, the, the quotes that I would like to reference tonight comes from this book. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Pardon me. And it says, vision is the ability to see the opportunities within your current circumstances. Um, a little bit about Rick Warren, um, who is the senior pastor for Saddleback Church. And Saddleback Church is one of the largest churches in the United States. That church, Saddleback, started long after our church. Most of the churches that exist both in, in North America and the Caribbean. And yet it's one of the largest churches in the United States right now. And so I always say to people, do not try to reinvent the wheel. God has already given you tools that are essential for your development. And, and I do, I, I really recommend this book. Uh, for the purposes of tonight's study, um, I'm actually using for my foundation booklet, Dr. Clarence Duff's um, book, Leading, Growing, and Sustaining God's Church, uh, along with the other books that I mentioned before, like Highly Performance Habits by Brandon uh, Burchard, uh, Tim Wu's The Attention Merchant, so on and so forth. But I'll post these two in the chat when I get a break, and um, we can take it from there. So I wanted to, my foundation text is centered in Titus 1. I'm going to ask you to go there, um, and I'm going to ask our reader, that's Titus 1. I'm going to ask one of the readers if you could read for me from verse 5. And I think you can go to... Maybe 9. So for, uh, Titus 1, verse 5 to 9. It reads, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Verse nine, holding fast the faithful word as he have been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Thank you very much, Sister Martin. Well, so here we see lying in the foundation text is Paul, who was the senior leader, and he's writing to Titus. 
And of course, Crete is a small island, uh, one of the places where Paul had planted several churches as he went on his four missionary journeys. And so he wrote this letter to Titus and gave very uh, specific uh, guidance on what Titus is supposed to do. We're going to continue with that narrative about process, criteria, and purpose. So those, those were the three things we talked about last week. We observe that where church is going to be successful, we need purpose, we need criteria, and we need a process. And, and that is fundamentally the business model of every business. So whether you're talking about Apple, Facebook, you're talking about, you know, Tim Hortons, oh, folks, and, you know, it doesn't really matter what you're speaking about. Fundamentally, every successful organization needs those three key components. You've got it out of a purpose. You have to have a reason to be. Why are you here? Why do you exist? Why are you needed? How do you create impacts and waves? What kind of culture do you uh, have? And I must say that, you know, in the past, we have never thought about those things when it came to church. We kind of thought about church differently. Like, you know, we just go to church and, and we just get on with, the, you know, worship, right? And, you know, sometimes even churches, I've, I've seen it where, you know, like the preacher comes, it's time for the preacher to preach and people just worship right through throughout the preaching. And I'm not saying that that's not possible, by the way, because I've seen that happen and it's genuine. Um, but, but I've seen where, you know, people worship through the, the preacher's time. And then, you know, when there was adequate time set aside for worship and really we didn't get anything more out of that period of time than, and then the word gets pushed back and then, you know, the, somebody makes these crazy statements like, oh, brethren, the spirit was moving. And, and, and I challenge those things, you know, I, I might not, you know, I challenge it. I'm saying, okay, fine. If the spirit is moving, what has the spirit done? What have we gained from this? You know, and I believe in that. If you, anybody here on this line knows me, hallelujah. You know, when it comes to the operation of the spirit, that that's, to me, that might, that's the number one criteria for church. I believe that the spirit of God is in charge of God's church. I don't believe I am. I honestly believe that. And that I am subject to the leading of the spirit of God. So let that be abundantly clear to our listeners tonight. But I'm sure you've seen it too. If you, know, you want to be honest, maybe you don't want to be. But if, you, if you're honest, you've seen it where the preacher comes and then the preacher has like, now he has five minutes for a sermon that he's prepared to preach for, for 40 minutes. Am I lying? Or you want to you write it in the chat and say if you've seen it? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Because, you know, I like to speak the truth. <clears throat> because I believe it's the only thing that really sets you free. I think, I think we lie to ourselves a lot. Um, myself included. But. The truth is what sets you free. When you can come to that place and acknowledge that you've done something wrong, I think you're the freest person on the planet. It's a fallacy to believe that you can do something and you're doing it wrong and then you lie to yourself and somehow it, is the tr it makes it true. The fact that you lie to yourself doesn't make what you say true. So, so the reality is, thank you for writing in the chat. I appreciate that. And I've just noticed as well, somebody says, uh, Cruz Bay, Seventh-day Adventist. Yes. Is that somebody from, uh, uh, oh, that's the Church of God. So that might be Pastor Seth. Probably one of the few people that may know that region very well. So thank you for putting that. Um, and so, um, no, I put a stop to that kind of stuff. I really do. I think for the brethren, at first it was awkward to see a man filled with the Holy Ghost who speak in tongues, stop people from speaking in tongues, because I realized that people were just emotional. 
you know, and 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 the leader, which is, I don't want to go off, you know, in, in a tangent here, but the leader, your responsibility is to ensure that the word of God, that there's balance. I think, oh man, can I tell you? Um, last week when we were having our studies and uh, Pastor Marshall spoke about, and he, he just said one word, he said balance. And it, all of a sudden my spirit just came alive. Hallelujah. My spirit came alive because that is one of these critical components that we are actually missing. So, <clears throat> so last week we talked about process criteria and purpose. And, and those things are, are key. Any operation, any business, that you are going to see. It doesn't matter how monumental that business is. It doesn't, and as a matter of fact, the bigger you get is the more robust your processes have to be. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when you're managing business, especially you're managing business across in a, in a particular, let's say you had one store and you had to manage that one store. Well, you just get up and go in and you see your employees every day, right? You talk to them, let's say you were the leader of that store. But let's say you had to manage multiple stores across America or across Jamaica or St. Kitts or Barbados or, you know, wherever we're watching from right now. That's a whole, your logistics now have to be tight. Your shipment, your orders, your, your product uh, live stream, your, you, so you have to, you, you now, you, some, some people even who started businesses cannot even sustain the business they start once it gets big enough. They have to actually hire people who go to school for that to do that, you follow me? Because they themselves don't have the acumen. They have the passion for the business. They have, you know, they, they, they can make the right product, but they cannot operate a, a large scale business. And not to mention when you go cross, cross border or cross culture, where now you have, you're talking to people, you have different languages. And, and let me tell you something, if I admire the Adventists like you would never believe, I admire these people, their passion, their process, their criteria, um, their purpose. I admire them. Over 140 languages, these individuals are, are, or countries, and in, in multiple languages and dialects, all their printing material. And when you go cross culture, you know, and I'm trying to drive home the enormity of the task that is ahead of us, the enormity of the task that's ahead of us. When you go cross-culturally and you have to deal with different governments and different regulations and different guidelines and different financial scrutinies and you have different policies that govern different countries. And if you are not, if you don't have strong criteria and processes, you, you, you just, you won't make it. You just won't make it. So I'm an advocate. I'm going to preach for two minutes and then I'm going to come back to teaching. <laughs> I want to preach for two minutes. I'm going to come back to preaching. I am an advocate. If you are on this line tonight, a minister of God, a brother, a sister in Christ Jesus, a budding evangelist, a, you know, a young minister, whatever you are, or whatever position you are in, I am an advocate for the idea of building something substantial in this world for the church of God seventh day. That's, that's, that's the personally, um, that's the mission I am on, period. That's the mission I am on, period. That's what I get up with every day in my heart and in my, in my lungs. That's what I breathe. Uh, my expression is this. I am filled with purpose and I am fueled by passion. That is my motto every day. I am filled with purpose and I am fueled by passion. Every day I get up, I, I say that like a Bible verse. And, and that's what inspires me to go further and to go longer, to lean into this. So, so here we see, so back to the lesson. So here we see Titus is clear. Titus, uh, uh, Paul is clear to Titus. This is the reason, this is the purpose. First of all, I've left you in Crete. And why have I left you here? I've left you here to ordain elders in every city. So elders in every city. And to set in order the things which are wanting. Because I've appointed you for that job. 
you probably haven't looked at this text that deeply. And it's just one verse. You probably haven't looked at it that deeply. You probably just read it, read over it. And, you know, we just say, well, Paul said to Titus, right? You know, you know our, our language, like Paul said to Titus. So we just put it out there. But, but on, on deeper scrutiny of the text, we realize that this is a business that Paul is, Paul is, Paul saying, you got to structure this thing. You got to structure it right. So here's what you do. Go into, go back to Crete. Um, and every church, go back to the church and set up the elders and appoint them according to the guidance I've given to you. And, and then he said, you know, set in order the things which are wanting. So what is that? What are the things that are wanting? <clears throat> Excuse me. So the things which are wanting, Paul is talking about the business aspect of the church. And you see this, um, you see this with Paul again with, and this was Paul's MO, by the way. You see this with Paul and, and um, uh, what's her name in, in, in Romans 15. Uh, excuse me, I, I'm, I'm, it's slipping me now. I'm getting younger. Uh, what's her name now? The lady in Romans 15. It will come back to me. But we see this, um, what Paul said to, to, wrote to the brethren at Rome and, and, and Phoebe. And Paul wrote the letter to Rome and said to the brethren in Rome, I'm sending Phoebe to you. I'm sending, she's a servant of the church. I'm sending her to you. And whatsoever things is that, um, and if somebody could find the text, maybe Sister Jackie. Some, I think I'm bad quoting right now, like some preachers. <laughs> so if you could find that for me, I think it's in uh, chapter 15 of Romans, um, where Paul wrote that to Phoebe. But he wrote to the church, sorry, in Rome, and said, listen, you've got to set up the things. When Phoebe comes to you, ensure that whatsoever she needs to fulfill the business that she's on, that you give those things to her. Process right? Process. Indicate when you have found it, Sister Jackie, and I will give you an opportunity to read it. So as we, as we look at it, so not only are you set up the business of the church, the things that are wanting, what's criteria again? We're talking about here structures. Paul said, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of writing or unruly, for a bishop must be what? Blameless, steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angered, not given to wine, not no striker, not guilty of filthy lucre, not a lover, but a lover, sorry, of hospitality, a lover of good men. You must be sober, just, holy, temperate, holding forth the word. Are, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Seriously. Are, you, are, you, are we reading the same Bible here? Look at the list. Look at the list that Paul is given to Titus. And the guidance and the structure that Paul says, when you go back, if a man wants to be in the office of a bishop, these are the criteria. And you read it the same thing with, um, he wrote the same thing to, to Timothy and gave him the same criteria. I have the scripture when you're ready, Pastor Green. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I think it's Romans 16. Oh, 16. That's correct. Yeah. My so verses one and two, it says, I commend unto you, Phoebe, our sister which is a servant of the church, which is at Sancria, that he receive her in the Lord as become of saints and that he assist her in whatsoever business she have need of you. For she have been a succorer of many and of myself also. Amen. Amen. And, and um, thank you so much. You know, the word, the word business is used a few times in, um, in the in the Bible, um, and I'm going to read some of the text. So that, that's of course in Romans 16, 2. <clears throat> um, Romans 12, 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So so Paul is saying, hey, not just your spirit, not just the spiritual things. You can't be slothful in business. You cannot be slothful in business. You have to be sharp. You have to be clear. You have to be concise. 
You have to have purpose. You have to have structures that are essential for success. Um, Acts 6, verse 3. We read this last week. Wherefore, brethren, look ye uh, out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. This business. So the business of the church is critical. Luke 2, 49. And said unto them, how is it that he sought me? This is Jesus responding to his parents when he was left back in Jerusalem. Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? So the business, so, so, so here we see that there's a clear indication that, that the church has to have or, or the people of God have to have a mind to understand that the thing that we are in is God's business is God's business and so it is essential that we understand that so I want to look at the word structure structure is defined so structure can be used both as a noun and as a verb and structure when used as a noun is defined as the arrangement of and relation between the parts or elements of something complex right? So let me say that again. When used as a noun, when we talk about structure, structure is the arrangement of and relations between the parts of, or elements of something that is complex, right? That's what structure means, right? So you know, I can use one of these books. This is not a complex um, idea, but it will do the job. So you have, it's a hard copy. It's a hard back. You have the book, you have the cover. It has a purpose. It has a purpose, right? It's to protect the softer pages on the inside. Then it kind of, of course, illustrates what the book is about, right? Maybe in some cases as a picture of the author and so on and so forth, right? Um, and then you have pages and then you have the bound, like the, the pieces that connect the pages um, at the bottom here. And, and, and so... This is, this is a structure. We wouldn't think of this as a structure, but it is a structure. It's just a book, but the principle is the same. When used as a verb, uh, a structure is defined as a construct or arranged according to a plan. Same thing we're talking about. It's arranged according to a plan. If you look at your computer that you're, you're, you're watching or you're using your phone, um, there's arrangements. The buttons are certain places. Um, the screen is at a certain place. It's it's some some. As a matter of fact, one of the things that most of us may not be even aware of is the amount of work that goes into research and development, even to create a cell phone. Hundreds of millions of dollars go into cell phone research and development every year. Sim and some of it is just to say, let's figure out what's the best size to fit into a person's hand. And they send millions of dollars to figure that out. So a construct or a range according to a plan to give a pattern or organization to, right? So again, look at anything um, that you see, right? It's organized, it's structured, it has a certain look and feel, um, and it, but it has to have purpose and intention behind it, right? Second word I want to look at is standards. So when we talk about standards, um, the standard is a level of quality or attainment. It's a level of quality. It's, 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 um, it's a difference between a Mercedes Benz and a, and a Honda Civic. Sorry if you have a Honda Civic. It's not meant to belittle your ride. You know, enjoy your ride. Don't, don't try to go buy a Mercedes now just because I just <laughs> say, but there's a reason, right? And there's a reason you could probably get a good Honda Civic for what? I don't know. I don't know what they sell for, but let's say $40,000. Is that reasonable? Anybody here know the price of Honda Civic? I'm talking Canadian money. So you'd have to work it out in Jamaican money. I don't even know how Jamaicans, I don't know how you guys look at money. It's just crazy. Like when I went there and a person goes, a loaf of bread is like 
a thousand dollars. I it just I don't understand. It's it's it, I know the exchange rate, but it's it drives I can't under like a thousand dollars is coming out of my pocket for a loaf of bread, and I just can't understand it. But I know it's a dollar for you know it's the exchange rate, but it's so hard to to settle down into that rhythm of paying a thousand dollars for a Pepsi. Yeah. Just it doesn't sound right at all in any stretch of the imagination. But um, so so when we talk about um, standards, we're talking about a level of quality and attainment. In other words, the, your Civic is going to sell for forty grand. Uh, a, a, you know, a quality Mercedes is going to start at maybe seventy grand. There's a reason for it. You can't just you can't just get up and just go. Well, I'm going to spend seventy grand for no reason when you can spend forty. Why would you spend seventy grand when you can spend forty? Doesn't make sense. Why would you spend thirty thousand dollars more? It's like that. Like, it's like a almost a year salary for some people to buy a car when you could buy a car for forty thousand dollars or thirty thousand dollars because there's something about the Mercedes standard, the quality of attainment, their brand. Their have you ever gone into and and part of this I'll get into this in the, maybe next week. Um, so we are launching a college. Um, we're actually, it's going to be called Shiloh Bible College. Um, that is coming online uh, this year. Um, Dr. Clarence Duff is, um, it will be the president of that uh, college, working alongside Dr. Uh, um, Stanberry and Dr. Grant. And they will be leading that effort for us um, to begin that college. We are hoping that in the next few years, maybe next five years or so, we will um, acquire enough student body and um, and our uh, build out enough processes and have enough resources to transfer it into a university. It is my it is my goal before I die to build the first university for the Church of God, and I'm going to move heaven and earth. I'll sell one of my kids if I have to, um, but it will be built, and nothing will stop it. Only God Himself can stop it, and I know God doesn't want to. Um, so, so we're in that process. Uh, we're in the registration process with the lawyers and the accountants, and hopefully that college will come online pretty soon. Uh, we'll offer remote classes. I'm just, I'm sound like I'm doing an advertisement here now, uh, but we'll offer remote classes through Zoom and various platforms. And we'll start off with simple um, diploma programs, certificate programs. Hopefully, um, soon enough we'll get licensing from the government to be able to um, give accredited courses for undergrads and of course, graduate levels to the PhD levels. Um, so, you know, we are, we are very confident that God is with us and we are gonna achieve that. Um, like I said, Dr. Duff, um, Dr. Duff is, is a very astute um, uh, professor. Um, he has two PhDs and this is uh, one of his book um, that he wrote and um, Brilliant piece of writing, actually. Um, personal friend of mine for over 30 years. So um, that's coming online. Uh, now I missed my train of thought. I got excited, got carried away. Um, so levels of quality. All right, I'm back. Um, so a level of quality, right? So um, also when we talk about standards, we're talking about an idea or thing used as a measure, a norm, a model in comparison uh, parative evaluation. So if I want to compare this phone with this phone, we're talking about a standard, just like I did with the cars, right? You have this car, right? And you have this car, right? And um, there are cars out there for like $2 million, right? US. There are cars out there for $2 million US, one car. Do you know what I mean? And um, there's, there, you can get a car for like, I'm sure, you know, you could probably get a good car in Canada for maybe $1,000. <laughs> you know, you have to do something with it, like, you know, get a new battery or a couple of tires or something, but could probably get a car for a thousand dollars. And yet there are cars out there for two million dollars. Right. They're built specifically for certain people. Um, as a matter of fact, there are car companies out there that will not sell their cars to certain people. They just won't. Even if you had the money, they won't sell it to you. They literally scrutinize the people that they sell their car. That's it. That there's a group of people that they sell these cars to. And, and if they don't decide that you are in the category to own this car, you won't get it. Doesn't matter how much money you have. 
because they they're they're not about money they're about reputation right um i don't know if you know this a bit of a we talk about business here um american express has a credit card and that credit card is by invitation only and we're talking about standards so you can't apply for the card you can't they have to send you the application they come and search, search you out to do the application alone it is eight thousand us dollars so when you're sending in the application so they come to you and they say hey apply for one of our cards we think you can get it for this card it's a black card you can google it it's not um it's not private information um they come to you and they say we want you to apply for the card and it's eight thousand or probably eighty five hundred now us dollars to apply for the card when you apply for the card there's no guarantee that you're going to get this card so i want you to imagine taking up eight thousand us dollars to apply for a card with still with the uncertainty that you're going to get it on the off chance that you get approved for this card because they only give a certain amount um you have to pay every year 2500 us dollars as the annual fee for that card whether you use it or not so eight eight thousand dollars to apply twenty five hundred dollars a year as your annual fee most of us have a credit cards that probably don't even want to pay twenty dollars uh, um, a year for the card <laughs> we just want the no fee card no annual fee we don't want to see it 2500 us dollars but it's only for an exclusive set of people and once and you can't apply for it and once you once they give you that card and you mess up they take it away from you, you you're just out of the running so we're talking about standards and, and how far they go and 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 what what surprises me more than anything else can i tell you this what surprises me more than anything else is that the church of God, we talk about God's excellence and we talk about God's standards and we talk about God's structures and we talk about it. But yet in reality, we don't practice it. Isn't that weird? Am I the only one who sees this? Like if you, you know, if you catch any preacher on any morning and they talk about, man, God is great and God is awesome and God is, is just is just perfect. And all of that is true. The reality is if God, if that is God, what does your church look like that reflects that? Are you following me? This is a good place. If you're uncomfortable, this is a good time to sign off. Um, I can give you another link. There's some other Bible studies going on that are, <laughs> I can probably, they're probably kinder to people um, that come to study with them. But I, I, I just taught the truth. I have no, I have no interest in whether you, a person feels that they, the, the Bible study was great or it wasn't. It has nothing to do with me. You can give me, you can give me ten thousand thumbs down. It really doesn't matter because I do this for the love. I don't do it for the likes. Right? I do this for the love. I don't do it for the likes. This is what I do, and this is who I am. So that, that, those are the definitions of standards. Let me go here. I have not been paying attention to the chat. I tend to just be long-winded. So let me see. I wonder which one you will see. So seriously, Lisa, this, this seriously, that, that, that's what you wrote in the chat. <laughs> this is all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. So I just want to see if there are any, any questions. There's one question, okay. Pastor one. Green. Why don't we take it? Um, somebody is asking, is it wrong to say that church is a business? Um, I don't know who asked the question, and I'm not going to look to see who asked it, because the whole idea is that I'm teaching the subject, the business of church. So then you'd have to tell me if you, the person who asked the question, then would have to, because that's what I'm teaching, the business of church. So then if I'm using that, obviously I don't feel it's wrong. So then you'd have to, maybe the, the person who asked the question um, would like to elaborate a little bit because it sounds to me like there's an under, undertone as if, mm -hmm. this is how I'm reading it. Please, the person with the chat, be bold and be bold and share your, um, 
their thought. I never, I never criticize. Um, if I, if I think you're wrong, I'll tell you that I think you're wrong. And if you think I'm wrong, you have every right to tell me you think I'm wrong. Don't even hesitate. That's cool. Um, but the undertone I sense is when someone like the person is almost saying, when I say that somebody else may say, Oh, you shouldn't think of church like that. That that's what I'm hearing in my head. So clarify for me, listener, if I'm wrong or if, if I'm spot on, I'll give you a minute. So I don't even, I don't know. I don't. Um, so the person who asked the question, if you, you can unmute too, you can talk to, you know, you don't have to go to the chat alone. <laughs> you can actually talk. It's a, it's called unmute. <laughs> Don't be, don't be shy. You know, uh, probably a good-looking person doesn't want to come in camera too. Um, all the pretty people always never want to come in camera. It's all the ugly people like myself like to be in camera all the time. So, no, are we not? No, Sister Martyr, that person is not coming forward. All right. No, probably all right. not now. <laughs> I, okay. All right. So, I hope I have answered the question. So, no, it's not wrong. It's not wrong because you've seen, I actually drew scriptures where you see in me the word business is in there. That's the Bible. So I'm not even making it up. Right? So uh, someone says, as long as we know whose business it is, I absolutely agree with that. I absolutely be, agree with that because the flip side of that is some people have really turned the church into literally a money-making machine. And, and I think that's just crazy. Sometimes I see them just like, I'm crazy. It's just, it drives me nuts. I just don't understand it. But, you know, to each his own. Every man has to face God. But so those are the, um, any other questions, by the way, or input before I go on? I think these were all the questions. All right, perfect. In the chat. All right, great. Um, so. Well, we have one hand up, Pastor Green, if you don't mind. Okay, I see. We have Evangelist Walker. Walker. Go ahead, Manjus Walker. Good, good night, folks. Um, I'm happy to have this discussion. And um, one of the problems that we face is that when someone decides to teach and to help the church in the way that you are trying to do now, we normally look at it as the person is in critical of the church and, um, you know, you know um, and trying to is as if they all want to say that the person is trying to pull down the chair, but that's not the case. You know, um, we have to look at the church and identify where the problem is and uh, make recommendations of how we can move forward. Um, I agree with you that uh, you mentioned about certain things that person, they have, they, you, you have some designers to you know, sir, that don't make clothing for some people, no matter how rich you are. Um, one of them is this guy from England. He's, he's a footballer and his wife does design. And the Kardashians wanted her to design a piece of garment for her and she refused it to do it because the Kardashian does not, and though they have money, does not fall in the category of the person that she normally make clothing for. You know, and right. so as a church, we have to set some standard, right? And um, and and going forward, we have there. And you, I, I like the way you started by looking at the church in terms of um, its numbers, right? We just look at the church. We, you know, at, at um, the amount of persons we have who are coming to our congregation. What is wrong with it? Obviously. Some people may say the Sabbath is not the Sabbath because Adventist is filled with people. Mm. And some may say it's the Holy Spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit because so many church who believe in the Holy Spirit have large congregation. So these are not the problem. So this is a good time. And I see what you are bringing forward that we need to just listen. But the problem is we are not brave enough, I think, to make the necessary change. We see it, but we are not brave enough to make the necessary change. And that's how I view it. Thank you, Brother Danny. Um, I concur. And thank you for your input. I do concur. 
Um, I think it's uh, you have made a notable um, contribution. I think I see Pastor Mitchell as well. Pastor Mitchell, your hand is up. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. Great. Yes, sir. Greetings. Oh, um, I'm I'm thoroughly supporting um, the point you make. I'm 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 a big admirer of the Adventists. I like this structure. I, I'm agreeing that there ought to be um, structure and standard. And let me just give a, a quick rundown um, with the pandemic, um, and I can't speak from a Jamaica perspective. So the pandemic has um, ravaged our islands and um, a number of people have lost their jobs. Um, there, there was a downturn in the economy and the people were not able to um, make their financial contribution either by way of tithing or free will offering um, as they used to be, quite a number of churches are experiencing severe difficulties in terms of paying their bills. <laughs> now, the church has to be um, a business. And, and let's look at the Adventists for one minute. Um, here in Jamaica, the Adventists is so structured. They have different income generating um, business. They have the hospitals, they have the school, they have supermarket, they have a number of things. So they could um, provide um, packages um, for their people, their ministers um, could survive because they were not only depending on one revenue stream. So I, I believe that, you know, as a church, we have to um, go back to the drawing board and um, look at this, the business of the church. You know, um, some of our churches are really not structured. They're splintered and, and they're, they're not professional. Um, there's no professionalism rather. And so if we're going to attract individual of um, different socioeconomic background, you know, they are not going to come into an environment where there's no structure, no standard, no order, and it's a, it's a free for all. So I, I endorse the point made and that of Sir Danny. Thank you so much. I'm gonna take the hands that I see up as well. And I just wanted to, to, to pivot with the statement to say that it's interesting because as the teacher, I am saying the same thing. Two persons spoke and they're ministers and they're saying the same thing. What does that tell you? Do you get what I'm saying? You're selling, we're selling a product and the people selling the product says the product that we have is not that good. So, so you, you get what I'm saying? Just think about that for a second from a mental standpoint. How are you gonna sell something that you don't even see it as, wow, this is amazing. You know what I'm saying? So, and I know, I can tell you this, I know the church of God is the right stuff in terms of its doctrine and principles. That I can tell you. That I can tell you. Church of God, seventh day, most of them. There's, you know, every now and then you come across a congregation that's just weird. But for the most part, I'll tell you the Church of God, seventh day. And I've traveled, you know, to, to Italy, to Spain, to, you know, Mexico, you know, you name it. We'll just, I've traveled and I've been to the Church of God and I've seen the spiritual depth of her. But so where she's broken is that she doesn't have the fundamental components in order to lift her up. All ships rise when the tide rises. So you've got to raise the tide and everything that's on the wave rises. That is an opportunity for us. And that's why I'm teaching this lesson uh, over the next couple of weeks. So I'm going to go to, um, I think that's uh, the seventh day. Church of God Barbados, so maybe Elder Sapp, and then we'll come back to Sister Jackie or Brother Cal. Go ahead. Hi, good night. Good night. Greetings to all. I hope that you can hear me clearly. Are you hearing me clearly? Blessings to you all. And I just want to, I want to concur. Um, I think that this topic was, is very intriguing for me. Um, why do I say that is because I just want to concur with the others that went on before me. And that has been 
the 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 organization, the Church of God, that be, has been our downfall uh, in regards to structure and organization. Uh, take for instance, in Barbados, we have one congregation, which is ours, one assembly, um, one Church of God Seventh Day, and we have basically that building because my dad built on his land, which is now too small. And when we look at the Seventh Day Adventists, there are 62 Seventh Day Adventist churches on the island of Barbados, which is 20, um, 21 miles long by 14 miles wide. And um, we are former Seventh Day Adventists. You know, we, we accepted the message. And had we known about the Church of God Seventh Day in Barbados, I'm sure we would have been way before. Um, maybe I would have grown up in it. Um, and that's just to say that there was not, there was no marketing. There was just, you know, when, when I found the Church of God Seventh Day in Barbados at that time, it was in a, a galvanized hut behind some bush. And um, I, it just turned me off and I went back to the Seventh Day Adventist Church. And this is, in, this, is, this, is, this is something that, you know, some people may take for granted, but this uh, presentation organization, I think that it don't fall is in regards to because we don't want to look at it as a business, as a business and so you, the product is not being promoted, you know, it's not being um, promoted, whether it be a nice sign, a structure or something like that. So I think that the, the downfall also is fragmentation. You know, if, if the, if the, if the uh, organization was, if we were more together, if we didn't have all these splinters and splits, I think that we would be really further. And in closing, um, you know, a lot of times when you said, when you reprimand, when we reference some of the Adventists, uh, some of the brethren don't want to hear that, but um, it's at the end of the day, it's factual, facts are facts. And I think that we need to take a leaf from, 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 from these, uh, from the some of the Adventists. We need to take a leaf from their book and, and implement, I'm not saying you're implementing everything, but if it's something, if you see something is working, it's effective, I think that you need to take note. When I say you, you know, I'm talking generally. And I, and I think that, you know, this has been a major downfall, um, not in Barbados only, but throughout the islands, throughout the, the Caribbean, throughout the region. So, you know, this is good that we are talking about it. And, you know, and I think that it, we should have a larger audience and, not, you know, that, you know, because this is crucial, Elder Elder Green. And I want to I want to commend you and Pastor Quarry and you all. Uh, for having this topic, a topic that a lot of people don't like to talk about, but we need to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elder Sal. Brother Cal, Sister Jackie. Yes, Pastor Green. I think, um, you know, I, I truly agree with uh, Pastor. He just finished saying that we need we need a, a bigger audience. You know, these these things that you talk about. I think it's a it's a very good topic, very relevant to our time. And as you mentioned, that we we need everybody to to hear. We need to have a to be so to a, a whole church conference, you know, to teach this because it's very important to the church to understand. Um, so one of the things that you you mentioned with uh, the Seventh Day Adventists, and also I see that uh, part of it in the Jehovah Witness is people. Mm -hmm. They have these these people. They 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 use um, the members expertise they don't have them sitting on the bench they Amen. use everyone like whatever they do Amen. they help they use them for the church purpose and you know they they, they use them and even this when they they go to school and they come back or even they they have um because the, the church supports them in everything so they these people they, they come back to, to work in the church, whatever the church needs. So that's that's one of the things I see, I admire about, about them they, because they, they work, whatever they have, they they use it, the expert is, it, they bring it back to the church. You know, but to me, the church, church of God, they, they old school, as if they're not open to new things. Mm. So I think it's time that we take a look at these things and use our, whatever expertise sometimes you have the I, I look at in my field maybe you have the 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 helper and we have a, a carpenter so the the helper directing the carpenter what to do and <laughs> so mm -hmm. this is creating trouble you know? <laughs> 
Yeah. So that's what I just I think yeah. you want to get me into trouble. You can't be making yeah. statements. Like that, you know? <laughs> if you go that, there, you're going to get me in trouble because, you know, I'm going to pick up on that. But I'm going to control myself. Um, and I'm going to continue because I have maybe about, uh, uh, I think we end at 9.30. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to say thank you. I, I just Everybody just breathe for a bit. Can you just breathe for a little bit? Just breathe. Just inhale. Just take some air in. You know, we we were talking about some rough things a while ago, right? And just, just whoosa, you know, just breathe a little bit. Because the next few years is going to be rough. And, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're trying to turn a speedboat, you can turn that speedboat in a, in a second, but try to turn the Titanic, the Titanic to go, to go in a 180 degree um, direction, that Titanic could probably take an, an hour. Where a speedboat, you can turn it in a matter of seconds. So it's a big problem. What I am sincerely happy about is that we are beginning to recognize that this is true. There have been people before me who have actually talked about this, but they were so in the minority that the popularity and the populace killed their voice. And, and so what you're seeing happening now in this time is God is amplifying the voice of those who actually know that God's church, the seventh day church of God is God's church. And it is not God. And it is not the Holy Spirit. As I mentioned last week, it comes down to our practices, our principles, our structures that are preventing us from achieving what God has mandated for us to achieve. So one of the things I want to lean right into right now so how do we know this? So if we go back to creation, right? Um, I want to give you this proposition. You can write it down. We build structures based on our expectations. And this is a build business model. We build structures based on our expectations. What, what do I mean by this? If a person builds a stadium, right? And the stadium can hold 100,000 people. If a person builds a stadium with seating for 100,000 people, how much persons do you think this person is expecting to be in the stadium? Anybody answer that? If I build a stadium with seats for 100,000 people, how many people am I expecting to be in the stadium? 100,000. There you go. Thank you. That's the idea. So whatever you build, your structure is going to tell me what you have expectations for. Do you get what I'm saying? So when I was a young man and my children were younger, we started to save money for their, their schooling and education because, and one of the standards we set in our home was that every single person has to go to college or university. You have to go. That wasn't a, that wasn't a request. That was a command. This, this was, if there was an 11th commandment, that was our 11th commandment. I would have writ, wrote it, written it in the Bible if God gave me the chance as the 11th commandment. So every single child in our home, you cannot leave this house. You cannot live in this house unless you go to university or college. That was the rule. And that was a, um, both explicit and implicit. And, and because I understood the value of an education. And some people think that, you know, as you talk about education, some people think that the education is against God. Do I look like a person to you that's against God? Look, Pamino, and look. Do I look like a person that's against God? No. Of course not, right? So what does my intelligence have to do with righteousness? Do you get what I'm saying? So, as, so there was a time when we, you know, we talk about structures and we talked about policies and we talk about governance and, and, and people just, they, 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 you know, their minds would be blown because they're like, you know, or sending kids to school and to, you know, go get your degree and go get your education and so on and so forth. And people would be like, oh my God, no, if you do that, you can't become a, you, what's, what, it was just nonsense. It was just fear and it was fear mongering. Now we, we clearly have amplified our voices and we have enough people in 
positions of authority to come to a place of understanding that whatever with the structure you build tells me your expectation. The structure you build tells me your expectation. Sister Quarry? Yes, sir. I just wanted to chime in to say, you know, um, it's it's bad to say this, but the truth is sometimes culture is um, a big influence on our lives. Um, and we need to come to the point where we de-culture and re-culture. And that takes time, as you say, the Titanic and the speedboat sort of thing, turning it around. But one of the things that I, I, I looked at, what my husband said to me, um, about maybe about going, going a month now, we have to keep our Zoom platform professional because Absolutely. this is what we want others to, because not everyone is going to be, we only have 59 persons here, but such a power-packed lesson and eye-opening lesson. We want the entire world to, to be able to view and to see and to re recognize and to acknowledge and to come to a point of change, you know? It's not a blame game. It's where we need to go and, and we need to move forward. So that's why we try to keep the platform as professional as we possibly can so that anybody can uh, come on and view the, the, the content and really be blessed accordingly, you know? And it's not because we don't want people to talk or we want, you know, that sort of thing sometimes. But my husband is saying, we gotta keep, always remember in the back of our minds, we're not really, our audience is not the 40 odd or 50 odd or even 60 persons who come online. Our audience is big and wide and we have to always have that in the forefront of our minds. So, so I just wanted to slip that in. Thank you, I concur. Yes, Brother Cal. Okay, this time it's me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I kind of just wanted to build on something my husband said earlier. I, I was asking myself a question, actually, Pastor Green. I was mm. asking myself first, are we very different from the Adventists or Jehovah's Witnesses in terms of our human resources? Don't we have the same skills? Don't we have professionals amongst us with the skills and experience that we need to be able to expand the church and to use the knowledge and water that we have. I believe we do because I know, I don't know a lot of the different churches, but I can identify in each congregation, you have doctors amongst us, lawyers, teachers, you name it, we have it, just like the Adventists, right? Mm. So obviously it comes down to maybe, like you said, I shouldn't say maybe, a lot of it is operations and how we view the church, right? Operations and structures and putting things in place. So I think one of the biggest problems is that we don't, and I want to say it properly, I, want to, I don't want to sound critical, but I don't think we really appreciate when we have people amongst us that can do things. So for instance, we have the carpenter or we have the person who went to school. I think sometimes, and let me speak from our solution context, a lot of the time we are looked down upon, those who went to school are looked down upon because people think, okay, a while ago, people used to say, God is coming just now, don't go to school. But the Bible also says, occupy till I come. So people kind of look down on those people with the skills and the experience and the whatnot, rather than saying, okay, let us use these skills that we have. Let us pull our human resources and let us build up the church. The pastor a while ago said, he, said, he also said something about fragmentation. So I think it's a, a, a problem that has a number of different dimensions. Our problem is that we have a number of different um, problems in one. So there's fragmentation, there is not really appreciating our human resources and trying to identify the gifts and talents that God has given to everybody and trying to put them together for us to work together as a unit and bring the church forward. If we continue to be fragmented and we're not using our human resources, the skills and gifts that God gave us for the work of the ministry, we're always going to be be at that at the same place stagnant not moving ahead because everybody's moving in a different direction therefore we're not going anywhere <laughs> i love your passion i really do i wish i wish i could just take you from past the quarry this is what <laughs> but then then that wouldn't be cool <laughs> Was the quarry? <laughs> you know, I thought the truth, right? <laughs> you don't have to ask what I'm thinking. I'll tell you what I'm thinking. So, and you know, we're not supposed to fight, but we're down. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so that's why I, that's 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 why I decided I'm not going to start it because I don't want to. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, Velvet. 
Thank you. Yeah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, everyone. Why is it? Why is it that um the 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 seven day Church of God is like is not recognized like the um the seven day Adventists? Mm -hmm. Because if you go out on the street and they ask you which church you attend, and I always say the seven day Church of God, they right. say seven day Church of God. I never hear of that one. I said yes, yeah, seven day Church of God. They said, no, that's the first time I ever hear that. You're talking about the Adventists. I said, no, it's not Adventists. It's a church of God, seventh day. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would want to know. If they could more recognize more out there, that people could recognize them to say, yes, we are the church, the seventh day church of God. Right. And, and that's my input. Thank you, Velvet. And, and you are so correct. There's a first for everything. Um, when you're established, people are going to know who you are and what you bring to the table. That, that's, so let me give you an idea. Let me give you an example. 30 years ago, there was no such thing as an iPhone. Can you imagine that? Like literally, can your mind imagine? There was no such thing as an iPhone. There was no such thing 30 years ago. And today, iPhones, when they launch them, there are lines. Well, now I guess with COVID, they, they, they're different, but they used to, iPhone, iPhones uh, launch events were like blockbuster movies. Who would have thought people would line up to spend $1,500 per person to get a product? line up for days. Some people go early in the mornings. Some people sleep overnight to spend $1,500 for a thing that you can just put at your ear and talk to somebody else, send a text and an email. Literally. I'm, are you kidding me? The same people would probably don't pay tithes, but that's another one. <laughs> I'll teach that another time. <laughs> but I'm just, I'm just saying to, to the points that were made, I see your hand evangelist. I'll come to you in a minute. I'm just saying uh, to Sister Velvet's question and input is people are attracted to greatness. Think about it. Think about it. People are attracted to greatness. People are attracted to success. Like who goes, who sees a, who sees a, a guy lying in a ditch, drunk, and goes, oh my God, when I grow up, I want to be like this guy. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever seen like somebody like, you know, <laughs> driving a whole busted up car and it's like, you know, your son goes, daddy, when I grow up, I want to buy a car just like that. I mean, everybody, it's, it's illogical. So what, what do we naturally do? A Ferrari, if you've seen one, passes you on the road and every head turns along with it. There, it's just in us. We don't, we don't even have any control over it. It's in us. That's why all the brothers on the a platform, that's why you all married beautiful women. That's, that's why you did it. You, you, don't, you, don't go, you don't go, well, you know, let me find the, the least intelligent woman in the church and marry her. Yeah, people have something built in them naturally by God um, that, that makes us gravitate towards something. Greatness, beauty, that's why when you go out and sometimes you see the sunshine or the sunset, it's irresistible. People just go, oh my gosh, look at that sunshine. Look at that sunset, right? There's something intrinsic in us that actually is attracted. Um, sorry, I take that back. Whoever, whoever gave me that feedback, I take that back. <laughs> All right, so... Oh, that was Sister Quarry. You're the one who says that. What, Pastor Green? Uh, we sometimes feel threatened by the ones who... Okay, good. I get it now. No, I'm not taking it back. I get it. I just understand what you mean. All right. So, so coming to you, uh, Evangelist. So I'm, I'm just driving this home. And again, I want you to breathe, brethren. I don't want you to feel threatening. This is a non-threatening environment. This is a non-threatening environment. You don't have to feel threatened. You, you can even have a difference of opinion on the matter. It doesn't even matter. We will entertain you just the same. You can speak freely if you have a difference of opinion 
on the issue. But I just want to say this is a safe zone. This is a safe zone. And what the information that I'm putting out there, I always say my job as a teacher or a lecturer is to put information out there. You, you as a student, you, you can decide what you want to do with it. You can say, oh, that's nonsense. Just move on. That's fine. Right? Um, and, and before I lean over to Brother Danny, I remember when my, you know, uh, so my colleagues, his son is a, is a medical doctor. He's the first medical doctor in our church. And I remember when he, you know, he decided that he wanted to go to medical school. It was a rough time for him as a young man. And, you know, he was such a brilliant kid, but didn't even get into Bible, in, into, into university, into the, the, the medical schools here. They didn't even accept him. And he had to go to some weird place to go get his, 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 um, his education. And today he's a full MD, the first in our church. MD, first in our church. And sometimes I see him and I'm just like, I wonder if he realizes what he has done. I said to myself, I wonder if he realizes he's such a humble ki kid. And I'm going, does this kid even realize what he's accomplished? That is the first. And so one of the books I recommended before I go over to Danny, um, this is my personal, it's actually in gold. It's my personal, <laughs> this is my guy right here. <laughs> um, it's called The Promise. Before him, it was never done. Are you following me? Before him, people said it was not possible. But Martin Luther King says over 50 years ago, the time is going to come when it's going to happen. And even if I die, you cannot prevent it from happening. Even if Howard Green dies, the promise is going to come through. It's going to come through. Some other young man is going to pick it up. And it, it, we're not going to stop until we actually, actually achieve greatness. That is our, prop, that is our motto. And we are, we are fueled by it. Let me, let me stop talking because I, I get passionate about this. And I have some content I want to finish. Danny, over to you. And then I think back to Cal. And then I'll continue yeah. with it. I, I, you could have talked a little longer, sir, because what you're saying maybe is more important than what I'm about to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, um, Jesus himself gave us a good product, which is the gospel, right? right? How we package it, and we have made it another product in a, essentially because how we package it is a problem. And so what we have is difficult to sell. What we have presently, as you said earlier, it is difficult for us to sell. So if you are going to even start a church in the best area, because of what, how we have packaged this product, which is the gospel, it becomes difficult for us to sell and for people to come and want to taste this gospel. So, so they may go somewhere else and taste it because they, it's not that they don't want the gospel, but because somebody else is presenting the gospel in a better way because I think you know I think that they are better tasting chicken than Kentucky chicken and probably right um but what or Kentucky has presented itself over the years you feel that it is the, there's nothing as good as as it so we have to look at that I, I, I hear sister Lisa and I agree with her or ever, let me just say this, that's not where it ends. It doesn't end with us having the, a good product, a production, right? How do you sell your product after that? You can have the best production and the most professional thing, and but you don't know how to sell it, right? Because if you look at our programs, even with, with what we have on Facebook, we're not getting much likes. We're not getting many likes. And why is it? because we do not know yet how to sell our product, right? Eventually we will get there, right? Eventually we'll get there, but we have to do it. We have to probably um, uh, be taught how to promote our thing on Facebook and whatever it is so that it can sell and persons will come on and, and, and once they latch onto it, then they will tell others. And because right now I'm sure that most of what we have Putting putting out there. So church of God people still saying that they are putting up likes. I know church of God people still are are attracted to it. So we have to find a way to move beyond that. 
right? It's always the product that we are selling, right? Other person, which is the gospel, other person have is have wrapped it up in better, and 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 as such, they are out selling us. And so, it, to me, I'm gonna say this. I'm not gonna. A lot of people are not gonna like me for this, but. I'm gonna say this: that we are, we have, we have, we have disappointed. God. Christ Himself is disappointed in us, in what He has given us, and we have messed it up because of how we have packaged it and how we have sold it and we have we have distributed it. We have taken a good product and we have made a mess of it, and that is why others are more successful. Because they have taken the product and they have made the best of it. And so we, from going forward, we have got to look at it. We have an opportunity and, and, um, and, um, and, and um, all these Zoom and all those things. I was still not even making an improvement. The same thing we normally have at church before the COVID, the same thing we have on uh, 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 Zoom. Same thing, same thing. No difference in what our approach yeah. is because there are no on a different platform. I am teaching on Zoom and I have to change. I cannot teach on Zoom like I normally teach in the classroom. We need to learn these things and our, our approach going forward. We have to adapt and we have to change with what is happening around us. Man, why I tell you, I think I'm going to integrate with a Danny in my preaching. Here's how it's going to work, Danny. I'm going to preach. And then when I want to unleash something that I want to say, I'm just going to go, Danny, your turn. <laughs> and then you'll be able to <laughs> just get it done. But, you know, let's breathe, brethren. Let's breathe. Let's breathe. Because this is a big, big, big topic. And there are individuals online right now that are very nervous about it. Because you see, when you have become when you are cultivated a certain way success is not always easy for everybody do you get what i'm saying i understand it success is not easy for everybody growth is not easy for everybody change is even worse so i think we have to breathe a little bit and lean into this thing with a certain degree of understanding that right now we are on the right path and i'm going to take some hands because i see them um, and I'm going to ask you to be as fugal with the time as possible because it's mm -hmm. 9.08 and I think I'm finished at 9.30. So I think it was Cal first, then Velvet, and then Pastor Hurd. Okay, so it's me. I have two quick points. The first one, I'm 100% agreement with Evangelist Walker. It was such a profound point. The product is the gospel, the word of God. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's our packaging, how we market it to to um the people out there that's one and my own point i went back to what you said earlier pastor green and i think it's also profound you said that and i wrote it down we build structures based on our expectations so i think underlying what you presented tonight the structures that need to be put in place the standards and the expect the expansion sorry that will eventually come we have to kind of work on the mindset so the, the foundation of all of those things, I think you were saying, is the expectations that we have. I think we have to tackle that first before we can even focus on the structures, standards, and expansion, because if we go directly to the structures, standards, and expansion, we will encounter the same problem. The reason I'm saying that, I kind of went back to our experience in St. Lucia. I was trying to figure out why were they discouraging people from going to school? Again, it was because of the expectation. They were saying God was coming soon. I remember it clear. We, I was just about maybe 10 years old and I remember people, the older people saying, God is coming soon. Why are you going to waste your time at school? Because a lot of our parents did not pay for schooling for us. We had to get scholarships to continue to go to school. And mm -hmm. up until a day like today, God is still not here. So if we had listened to them, we would not have gone to school. So I think it's the expectations is the big problem there. And we have to work on that. It doesn't matter if God comes today or tomorrow. That's irrelevant. We can still be doing what we have to do in the meantime. When he Amen. comes, he will find us doing what he asks us to do. So I, like I said, we have to tackle that thing. I'm sure that Adventist people were not thinking that way. That is why there's so much 
for the ahead of us. So let's talk of expectations. Let's get the mindset right. Stop focusing on the fact that God is coming tomorrow. We don't care with that. Let's do what he asks us to do in the meantime, while we are here on earth, while we are alive. Focus on that. That's the key thing. And then we build the structures, timers, and, and get the expand, expansion we're waiting for or we're expecting. That is amazing. I, I'm, I'm so grateful. I don't think I've ever heard you talk. If I took the amount of talk that you did tonight, Sister Jackie, from the time I know you, I think you have talked more tonight than that maybe 20 years I've known you. If I put all that 20 years in one, that means yeah. that you're passionate. You're passionate. I'm very about passionate about that. I love, sure. I love it. I really do. And this is how people should come to the table passionate. Whether you're wrong or right, doesn't really matter. Come to the table with your passion. Be filled with passion. And I, you know, you have to be filled with it, to be fueled um, with it. I want to, before we go to Velvet and then over to Pastor Heard, I wanted to read something that I wrote that will be the governing guidance for our organization. Don't move, ladies um, and gentlemen. Um, I wrote this. This is the last line of it, an excerpt that will be in our newsletter magazine. Um, I wrote this. We are, as we contemplate the future, we invite you to join us in our purpose. And I wrote three purposes that are going to be guiding the church, at least the ones that we serve in. One, our first purpose will be to deepen our spiritual outlook. That's purpose number one. And I'll tell you why I referenced this in a minute, and we're probably going to wrap up with the hands and then hand back, and then we'll continue next week. So first thing we're going to do is deepen our spiritual outlook. The second purpose that we're focused on is sharpening our operational practices, which is why I'm so passionate about this. I, I see a gap in our operational practices. And then thirdly, to expand our global reach. These are the three pillars that will be guiding the Church of God's seventh Sabbath keeping that, that we belong to. And, and, and why is this? Why am I drawing this out? I'm drawing this out to state this. It is the leader's responsibility to set the tone. If you don't, if you don't have an idea in your head where this church is going to go, and if you don't share what's in your head with the people that you're leading, how are you ever going to go there? Your purpose becomes the thing that drives you. When we talk about structures and we talk about uh, expansion and when we talk about uh, operation, your, your, your vision guides you. In other words, when, we, when the board comes to me and the board says, Pastor, we want to do this. The first question I ask is, does it align with our purpose? I don't care how cute it is. It's cute. Okay, fine. But does it align? Will it help us get to where we want to get to? If the answer, if you can answer that question and the answer is no, we're not going to do it. Right? And that's why I'm recommending, before I go to uh, Velvet, that's why I recommend this book. I think it's a fabulous resource. Uh, it's an easy read. If you're, if you're a church leader or any church uh, uh, person, I would highly recommend that you read the, um, the Purpose Driven Church. Uh, Velvet, and then over to Pastor Hurd. And then I'm going to ask everybody to be brief because I only have like 16 minutes. Velvet, yeah. over to you. Yes, Pastor Green. Um, what I'm trying to say, right? I think we, the Seventh Day um, Church of God people, are too prejudiced. We can't go out there and sell products, and the product is the Word of God. So what we need to do is go out there and and sell the product to the people that they could know God for themselves, also because there's a lot of people out there even don't even know God and know who God is. So we, okay. we need to throw away um, prejudice and pride. Like this, like, just like the Jehovah Witnesses, they go to the door, no matter what you say to them, leave my door, don't come back here. They're still coming back to sell the product. And they're selling the product, the word of God. So we need to go out there and sell the word, the product also, that other people could know and recognize who is God and the product will sell. I believe, I wish, I wish you were here with me in Canada, Velvet. I would take you under my wing. I love your passion. I love your energy. This is really good. You're, you're trainable. You're teachable. I can tell. Thank you for your input. Pastor Hurd. Blessings, blessings, everyone. Good evening to the distinguished pastors online. I am so 
blown away by this. This is awesome. I'm hearing some powerful argument. And I just want to say, uh, Pastor Green, that um, this is just amazing. The question I want to ask, and I'm hoping that uh, it will be a part of uh, your presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to be redundant in terms of what Evangelist Walker has said. But when we look at the churches, and uh, I know there are pastors and leaders online, from day one, things were not working, period. Now, we are in a new normal, call it the pandemic normal or whatever it is, uh, especially as it relates to the internet platform. Moving forward, why would anyone want to say, let's go back to the normal in church, Sabbath school, all of those stuff that was not working. And I don't mean any offense to any uh, pastor or leader on, online, but what I'm saying clearly, if something was not working, and you have said that, I think, if it was not working, why would you look forward to going back to it rather than making the adjustments that are necessary in order to move the church forward? Thank you. It's a great question. It's a sound question. Um, there, there are certain aspects of our new normal that will remain with us. And it is going to be, we'll talk more about this next week, but it will remain with us simply because um, Part of the body of Christ is fellowship. It's 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 what makes you go into. I, would, I like I like Apple, Apple Store. I, I really am an Apple fan. I buy it. All my products are Apple products. I just I think they're amazing. That's just me. Um, they're a little bit more expensive on the higher end, but I'm telling you, they're brilliant. And 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 I re I remember. Apple came out with the first, they built their first stores. And when they built the first stores, um, the then CEO um, said, we're going to build a store and we're going to put all our products out. We're going to put them on the shelf and we're going to allow our customers to come in and touch it and feel it and get a touch of what they're getting rather than just buying something and you don't know what it feels like. And then he came up with another brilliant idea. He said, we're going to also allow our customers to take home the product and have it for two weeks. And if you don't like it, just bring it back. Never in the history. Any, nobody thought about that. That was possible. Like People were like, this is crazy. Everybody thought he was crazy. And today, Apple stores are probably one of the most elegant pieces of um, stores that you can go to buy stuff, the way they're done is just brilliant. So to your point and to your question, which I think is a brilliant question, some aspects of the church has to change. And then certain offers are going to become more prominent for certain churches. But why it is necessary to have physical church as opposed to just having virtual church, what it fails to offer is the fellowship, the touch and the feel, the hug, you know, all of that is great. I talked to my mom through, you know, through the phone and stuff like that. She lives in Florida. But I'm telling you, there's nothing sweeter than when I fall into my mom's arms, when I reach down to Florida. That, that I can, no, nothing can exchange that. No, no phone call or seeing her virtually. I need the touchy-feely. What I think is important, Pastor Hurd, is as we lean into this new normal, what will be important is what are the lessons learned? What are the lessons learned? And to, I think Sister Quarry said this earlier, that, you know, when you're on a platform like this and you are vulnerable to the entire world, it becomes important that you, again, have understand business practices. Do you know what I mean? It's just something you have to learn. And so one of the things that I'm going back to Sister Jackie before I go to uh, uh, pass the set and give him a minute or two, um, is learning. Learning has, has, has played such an important role in success. Now, 
the Adventists, they figured this out early and we're using them as sort of our template. And back in the 18, uh, the early 19th century, the Adventists started a model. And the model that they started was that none of their ministers will be, um, if you wanna be a minister, you have to be educated for it. And once you're educated, that's what you do for your job. So they started that model. Um, the second thing they did, which is so brilliant, they, they, they said, when a, when a minister is placed in a church, that church doesn't belong to him. <laughs> so you can be here for two weeks and you're done. You're off to another place. First of all, we're paying you so we can move you anywhere. And then the second thing is that what they have done is that they have taken off the label and they have not attached the congregation with the minister. So that when a minister leaves, the people there know that he's just there to serve. That's not his church. And, and a lot of ministers have placed their full credentials on the churches, full. Let me tell you something. We and God are gonna have some serious conversations. I don't know how that's gonna work, but I'm telling you, we have placed our, you know, it's this person's church. And, you know, when we even have a conversation with the brethren, it's a conversation like something like, well, you know, I build this church. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> it's, it's, it's ludicrous. It's madness. And so the Adventists have done a brilliant job in educating their ministers. Every minister in the Adventist church has to be trained and, and be prepared to go out. And this is what I don't understand. I never understood it. I never understood. Does anybody here go to a doctor that hasn't been to, 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 to medical school? Please raise your hand for me. Unless you have a Bush doctor somewhere. That, but, but, but please, the first thing we want to know is that this person is qualified to, to manage my health. Who goes to a lawyer's office and goes, yeah, it doesn't matter that you went to school. I don't care if you went to school. Do you have, do you, can you print off somebody else's diploma and write your name in it? Because as long as I see that on the wall, that's fine. None of us does that. We go to the experts for things we need from the experts, right? And we don't go to the doctor to buy, to buy meat. We go to a butcher. It, you know, this is a simple, basic understanding in life that is necessary for us to apply. So, when we so 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 here's the, here's what I mean by this. So then we come to church, and then we say what? Now remember, you know, yesterday you went to the doctors and you said you're not going to that. You hear that doctor is not good. And you went to the lawyer to get your 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 papers for your house or whatever, and you go to the lawyer and you pay a certain amount of money. But when you come to church, don't get me preaching today. I, I'm telling you, I will I will talk out the business. When you come to church, you want some pastor who doesn't know A from B, and all you say, well, why, why a pastor, man? No. Why would you have that expectation? It's ludicrous. It makes no sense. So, so the, the, the Adventists have done that, those two things. I think they've done it well. The third thing that they've done well when we talk about, uh, thanks for bringing down your hand, Seth because I only have uh, six minutes and I wanted to maximize it. I appreciate you a lot. Um, the second thing that we talked about when we talk about structures and standards as it relates to standards, and I, and I gave the definition at the start, standards have to do with, if you ever looked at the Adventist um, operational model, it's about 108 pages, and that's their constitution. And when you read their constitution, it is so detailed that you can't go wrong. You can just pick it up. You can just pick up their book and go, let me see. So how, how do you disfellowship somebody? It's right there. This is how you disfellowship a person. So you can't make it up as you go. You know what I mean? You can't make up disfellowshipping a person as you go because they write out the standards for which a person can be disfellowshipped. And when they, and they write out a standard to say, I think one of this, I'm trying to remember, but it would say, I see your hand, Paul. It would say something like, if a member is disfellowshipped in this church, they can't go and become a member of another church. You can't be disfellowshipped in an Adventist in, 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 let's say, Montego Bay, and then you go and take membership in an Adventist church down in, in Trelawney. 
or I don't know if I'm getting this right, but, but you understand what I'm saying? No, you can't do it. I guarantee you in the church of God, you kick me out of this church right now, I find one down the street and they'll just open their arms and take me in. No questions asked. So, so these are standards. These, we have no, we have little standards. And when these, when there is no, when there, when there is little structure and when there are limited standards, we, it's impossible for us to expand. And then people, and then you, the, the person who is leading the church is left to make up the standards as they go. I have made it clear in our um, constitution, and we are in the process of revising that, that everything, all the, the, the rules and governance that actually governs the president's office, and this is, um, so when my term is done, and a new president takes over, those standards govern that president. I go back and take my role as a pastor and I'm subject to the new president. That's how the standards work. That's how we do that work. And I, and I, and I can't for the life of me understand it, that the same people, this is the pet peeve of mine. You can, you're gonna hear it a little bit. Sister Mitchell, pray for me. I know you're praying for me. Pray for me right here because I'm about to, <laughs> about to blow this up. It doesn't make sense to me and tell me if I'm wrong, that we have, we have a certain standard when we go to work. So we have time standards. You know, maybe after two or three times you're late in a, in a, in a quarter, your boss calls you in the office and says, listen to me, this is not going to work. And I, I tell you what's going to happen. See, by next week, you're like 30 minutes early every day. God help the pastor, whoever calls a sister or brother and says, you know, I notice you've been coming to church early. Mighty God. You, I mean, you get a sermon, you know, at that, you know. Pastor, you don't know that four picnic we have. What is the same four picnic you had when you went to work yesterday at 7 a.m. in the morning? The same four picnic you have. Do you have less children on Saturdays? Like, 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 really, what happened on Saturday? <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> let's breathe. Let's breathe. Let's breathe. This is a safe space. Pastor Green is just passionate. He loves you. He means nothing by what he's saying. <laughs> but I'm trying to get us somewhere. I'm trying to tell us that where we are right now is not the best place. And with the few minutes that we have to go, I'm going to take Brother Paul first before I give my closing thoughts and hand back to the moderator. Brother Paul, you may unmute and make your statement. Yes, sir, Pastor Green. Thank you, sir. Um, I wait. I was here last week and I want to ask a follow up question that Brother Carl asked you, but I said I'll wait until this week. Sure. So this time, you mentioned that um, the seven deacon, they were of honest report. Right. And, um, and you said something like, um, word for word, I can't say something like, we are not honest and um and so on so on mm. um how can we honest in this relationship keep it pure consistently okay well honesty um honesty what helps us keeps us honest is written written guidelines written guidelines helps to keep us honest personal honesty comes from a person <clears throat> my apologies but but guidelines help us to be honest so right now at my work i'm doing what is called cmtt's every year the bank sends me a certain amount of training that i have to complete mandatory and there's a deadline to complete it if you want to see a black man sweat you let that deadline is coming and we have certain amount. You want to see sweating because I'm telling you, the senior vice president, he doesn't joke when it comes to this. You've got to finish your CMTTs on time. Every year we have to do it. And, th and then we have policies and we have what is called code of conduct. And the code of conduct is a written set of guidelines that, that, that you know, officers have to follow because it is essential for the operation to work successfully in the way that you discipline people. So, so, so there's general honesty that's really about your personal um, 
way of being as an honest person. But then you have operational honesty, which means that the guidelines are given to you and, 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 and that governs the way that you operate. So for instance, within it's not that I think the person taking up the offering is dishonest, right? Listen to me carefully. It's probably my last point. It's not that I think the person that's taking up the offering is dishonest, but I'm going to put rules in place that if he's dishonest, it's not going to affect the way that it's done. Do you get what I'm saying? So in our, so part of our policy is this. At no point can any one person take up the offering. It, it's always in dual custody. Right? So, so the ushers come to the aisles. They pick up all the offering. When they're going from the, congreg from the church to the, the finance office, two of them have to go. So if the two of them are in cahoots, now I got a problem. But, <laughs> but two of them have to go and, and everybody signs off that money's in the office and they lock the door and the finance team comes in afterwards. And so we have processes in place that ensures that governance guides that. I cannot write a check. I cannot be on the finance team. That's a policy of the church. I can never write a check from the church. Every check that's written to me has to be written by the finance office and has to detail on the check what purpose this is, 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 is um, illustrated for. Pastor Quarry, you'll know this is true. Whatever monies are given to me, whether to operate as a leader or, or compensation that's given to me, that comes from the church finance team. Do you understand what I'm saying? These policies... These policies are and rigor that we place around these things is to prevent Pastor Green from one day thinking that, well, you know, things are really hard at home and maybe I should just borrow some money. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so from that standpoint, Brother Paul, policies um, um, really help us navigate around um, dishonesty. It sets the right tone uh, and allows for individuals to operate on a particular guideline. And then the last thing I want to talk about is that, and then I'll get back to you, Pastor Corey, it drives accountability. If you don't have policies, you can't drive accountability. If there is no speed limit um, on the 401, and I'm going 150 miles an hour, and a police pulls me over, and, I, and he goes, oh, you are speeding. I said, well, what's the speed limit? He goes, there's no speed limit. I just know you're going too fast. I'll just take off. Until there is a guideline, then you cannot drive accountability. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, so most churches right now, I guarantee you, don't have any guidelines. They don't have any written policies. They don't have any um, uh, bylaws. So, so really, everything goes by the seat of the pants of the people that are in charge. And so as we breathe, and I'm gonna transition back to Pastor Quarry for closing, um, I want you to understand the enormity of the task that's ahead of us. And I wanna to say to everybody on this line, you have a part to play. Can I challenge you for a bit? That you have a part to play. Some of my greatest achievements in church was not because I figured something out. It was because somebody figured out something and challenged me. If anybody on this platform watch our programming on TV, on, on the internet, you see the quality of programming that we, we put in. Because somebody challenged me and said, Pastor, we need to buy this equipment. And I'm just there. And I'm like, you know, to Pastor um, Hurd's point earlier, when, the, when they, the brothers would come to me and say they need, I, I'm like, more money again? Like, seriously? For buy what? For buy what? So, Pastor, we have to buy this thing, you know, because it's going to make this thing so and so. I said, no, more money? I'm not approving it. I'm not approving it. So then, you know what the, these gentlemen do? They're brilliant people. They buy the product and then they show it on the screen. And when I see it, I go, geez, I'm a mercy, man. 
what a thing look good. <laughs> That's so cool. But if it was left to me, I'm telling you, I wouldn't have done it because I didn't understand the value. So I have learned as well. I've grown so much in the last few years, maybe the last decade or 15 years. I've grown so much to understand the value of people. You that are on this program tonight, you are the magnet. You are the people who have the opportunity. That's why God allowed you to be in this program tonight. You may be in leadership, which means that you're going to have to rethink. You're going to have to, and this is, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Pastor Corey, I'm pushing your boundaries here. But, but leaders who have no mentors, leaders who have no guidance, leaders who have no training, and just decide, well, you know, I've, the Holy Ghost is going to teach me. You're, you're, you're backing up the wrong tree. I can tell you that for free. I used to be there. I know exactly how that feels. And, and then I'm going to tell you, you, you need people to guide you. And you have to be, you have to be humble enough to recognize this, that I don't have what it takes and I need help. You have to acknowledge that. I'm telling you, it's a huge part of my learning is to acknowledge that I need people. And then to you, the brethren, challenge your leaders. Challenge them in a good way. Buy them a book. Buy them a book and say, Pastor, read it. And if you can't read, let me read it. I just sit down and listen. You must go and listen. So get in the habit of, 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 of figuring it out. And, and here's what I'd like to end with. I'd like everybody on this line. I think we have still about 61 people. I'd like everybody on this line to do me one favor. I'm going to ask only one commitment. One commitment. Are you ready? I'm going to ask you for everybody on this line to think about one thing in their church that they're going to help to change for the better. Let me say that again. I want everybody on this line just to think about one thing in their church that they're going to help to do it better. Because you know what would happen by Sabbath? We would have 61 changes. Can you imagine that? We'd have 61 changes across the globe from different countries and different churches if everybody just took one thing and says, you know what? I'm going to help change this. I'm going to help change this. So it could be buying your pastor a book. It could be, you know what? He, maybe you're, you're financially enabled and you can you know, say, pastor, I want to send you on a course. You know, I, I, um, I was at church a few weeks ago and a brother just walked up to me, gave me a check for 10,000 Canadian dollars. Just go, Pastor, here's $10,000. I'm not even kidding. Another brother walked up to me and he gave me a check for uh, a, a envelope and I took it to the finance office and the finance people say, oh, there's $2,000 in it. I tell you these stories, I'm not, I'm not lying. Another brother called me the other day and said, Pastor, you know, I got a bonus from work. I'm never expect to get to, you know. And he just said it's $1,000. And he just wrote a check for the $1,000 and gave it to the church. These people have shaped my thinking so that I used to pay 10% tithing. That's what I used to pay because that's what the Bible says. And these people shaped me. I don't even think about 10. I'm past 10% a long time ago. I don't, I don't even worry about that anymore. I, I don't even think that like that anymore. When I'm writing a check, I just write whatever is in my spirit. As long as it's over a certain number, I just write whatever God is putting in my heart. And I'm telling you, it's never failed. It always works. So I have this confidence in me. And this is my preaching spirit for the th last 30 seconds. I have this confidence in me. Paul says that you will be no otherwise minded, but the mind that was in Christ, that is in me and in you, that we have the privilege right now to do something different, one thing that's going to make a difference to move the church forward. I want to thank you for your time. And I want to thank everybody for your participation, whether you spoke or wrote in the chat. I want to really thank you. And Pastor Quarry, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm speaking like I won't be here next week, but I will be. <laughs> so, but thank you very much and God bless you. Back to you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Pastor Green. Wow, amen. To God be the glory. And I believe by now we all, you know, have 
written down our one you know area that we want to improve in I want to thank every well i'm not going to give the vote of thanks sister goodner will come forward and do that and so I, again i want to give god thanks for tonight you know it is my desire you know and pastor green you said it well as leader one of the things that will help the church as well if the leader is humble if the leader is not humble you know, then that would be an endurance. And so we give God thanks and we just pray that the spirit of God will be in us. Amen. As we seek to take the kingdom of God to another level in the 21st century. Bless you and thank you, sir. I'm going to ask Pastor Heard at this time. We're not going to hold you any longer to do the closing prayer for us and Pastor um, Marshall. Um, do the benediction for us, and Sister Gooden will do the vote of thanks. We close right there. Amen. Blessings, blessings, blessings. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we approach the mercy seat this evening. We want to say thank you with a loud voice for what we have received this evening. We're asking in the name of Jesus that you will allow the vision as put forward by Pastor Green to uh, go across the globe to every church, to every pastor, to every leader. We ask that you will give a humble spirit and open your minds that we will understand that your church, hallelujah, oh Amen. blessed be your name, your church, hallelujah, must be seen by the world because it is through the church, through your people whom you've called, amen, that the world will see you and come to glorify you. Again, we are thankful and we're asking you to bless the vision, amen. the school, the ministry, everything that has been put forth. Lord, we receive it in our hearts. We receive it in our hearts. We ask you to bless it and allow it to go forth in an exponential manner. In Jesus' name, amen. God Praise bless God. You. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Bless you. Pastor Marshall. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. Good and faithful servant and now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our father majestic dominion and power both now and forever in the name of Jesus let the church of the living God shout thank you Jesus Thank, Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Thank Hallelujah. You, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise Thank God. Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise yeah. you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah. Praise God. Sister Gooden. Praise the Lord. Amen. On behalf of Pastor Quarry and our host pastor, all the officers and members of the Church of God Sabbath keeping here in Ottawa, I want to use this opportunity to say a big thank you to all our brethren and friends who have joined us this evening. 